good evening everybody uh, i am dr sita from aims faridabad uh, i am going to present a case of mr abc he is a 50 year old male married shopkeeper by occupation he is a resident of singroli madhya pradesh uh, history has been given by the patient himself and it is reliable uh, the chief complaints were uh, multiple episodes of loose stool and vomiting since last 20 to 25 days a uh, bilateral lower limb swelling shortness of breath cough with scanty sputum and decreasing urine output since 10 to 15 days uh, i would like to start my history on uh, 25 days back uh, prior to admission in the uh, local hospital since last 3 to 4 days he has complained of multiple episodes of loose stool and vomiting and since last 1 to 2 days he is complaining of dizziness along with decreasing urine output Uh, though measurement has not been done but as per the patient there is decrease in frequency and the amount of urine in last 1 uh, to 2 days uh, he took some over the counter drugs for the same that include some antacids antiemetics and ors packets for his gi symptoms but as he did not get any relief from this medication so he consulted a local physician in his town after 4 to 5 days of his symptom onset uh, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But the vomiting is yes. the vomiting yes. Since last week. Uh, the last history was given 25 days back. Yes. But the presenting symptoms were 3 to 4 days. Uh, both uh, at the same time. Yes, sir. Both at the same time. Uh, no, uh, nausea, vomiting along with uh, loose stool. And thereafter, uh, since 1 to 2 days, he is complaining of dizziness along with decreased urine output. Uh, when he went to the local physician, there uh, he was told that he has low BP and some GI symptoms for which he was given IV fluids along with IV Ciplox as remembered by the patient. Uh, at that time, his serum creatinine was four milligram per deciliter. That patient was admitted for about two to three days in that uh, clinic, and then in view of worsening renal parameters and no clinical improvement, the patient was at, uh, was referred to higher center. The rise in serum creatinine is as shown in the slide as from four to six mg in last two to three days. Uh, then he visited to the uh, new uh, hospital where he was evaluated further. His GI symptoms has not resolved and he had persistent low BP at that hospital also. Uh, so he was given IV fluids along with higher antibiotics for GI infection control. In that center also he was told that he has some uh, gut infection, but uh, at that time he is not aware about the antibiotics that he has been advised by the physician. Though there is, uh, though he has been told that his GI infection, but any blood, stool, uh, urine, or ultrasound or X-ray didn't reveal any infective foci at that time. Uh, his uh, renal parameters shows improvement from 7 mg to 4 mg over the next 7 days along with uh, his bp has improved and his urine output has also improved to 1 to 1.5 l uh, per day in la- next 4 uh, to 5 days however since na- in the next 3 to 4 days he had again acute worsening of his renal parameters which rises from 4 to uh, 6 mg per dl but here uh, he has uh, developed bilateral lower limb swelling along with shortness of breath cough with scanty sputum and the urine output has uh, decreased up to 300 to 400 ml uh, per day here with the measurement has been done as he was in the uh, healthcare center uh, this lower limb swelling was insidious in onset progressive in nature the patient has first noticed the low, uh, lower limb swelling which progresses up to the knee in the next 4 to 5 days it was associated with shortness of breath which was more on lying down position he also had complain of cough with scanty sputum and there is a decrease urine output uh, he gave a significant history that in the last 3 to 4 days uh, his bp has uh, risen up to 140 to 150 two to three times for which he has been prescribed some anti hypertensive medication but he has not known the name of that medication followed by which he has again developed that complaint of dizziness or drowsiness as he has experienced previously during his uh, gi symptoms so uh, he was evaluated further for this acute worsening of renal parameters uh, as per the patient he has been told that he has some lung infection 
along with a fluid overload and low cardiac uh, image, low cardiac functioning. As uh, uh, there is uh, as the as the as per the patient, uh, the doctor has told him that there is rise in the uh, blood infection marker along with its cardiac functioning has been reduced. But it is most likely related to infection, not due to any heart disease, as his serial profile were also normal. Uh, he was given a broad spectrum antibiotics uh, in view of suspicion of any infection, plus IV diuretic uh, to increase the urine output and to decrease the uh, fluid overload status. But in view of uh, uh, inadequate direct response and worsening renal parameters, he was initiated on hemodialysis after securing the right femoral SD catheter. Uh, in that center, he underwent uh, three sessions of hemodialysis, but then he was referred to a higher center for further management. So the patient came after 20 to 25 days of symptom on onset to our hospital. And in that uh, and at that time, he was in fluid overload state, sepsis and the serum creatinine on admission was 8 mg per deciliter. So, uh, in our hospital, we, uh, in, uh, we uh, initiated him on hemodialysis. There were three hemodialysis sessions done and he was planned for a renal biopsy to look for the cause of renal dysfunction after taking the proper history examination and reviewing his old records. So, uh, in negative history, uh, there is no any uh, urinary complaints like hematuria, frothy urine, nocturia, polyuria or flanking. No history of fever, sore throat or any other uh, URDA symptoms or skin rashes. Uh, there is no history of photosensitivity, joint pain, oral ulcers, alopecia, no history of hemopsis, uh, no history of any sets uh, or alternative medication intake. Uh, the drug history that we have encountered in, in the, uh, from the patient in last 25 days is the over-the-counter medications. Uh, in which the PPI he has taken for about uh, 3 to 4 days, antibiotic ciprofloxacin IV for about 5 days, and some higher antibiotics which he has taken in uh, for which he has, he has been prescribed for his GI symptoms and lung infection, but the name is not known to the patient. One single antihypertensive uh, agent uh, for uh, high BP and uh, IV diuretic after the development of fluid overload. The history of past illness, uh, there is no history of diabetes, hypertension, cardiac disease or any other systemic illness, uh, no any similar complaints in the past or no any uh, history of uh, uh, prior hospitalization. Mm, family history, uh, he is a single child of family born out of non consanguineous marriage, he lives with his wife, he had two children, one boy and one girl. Uh, there is no any uh, history of diabetes, hypertension, pulmonary tuberculosis in the family or there is no any family history of kidney disease or similar complaints in the family members. Uh, personal history, uh, he is a non-smoker, non-alcoholic, uh, he used to take mixed diets, sleep, bowel pattern, appetite or normal. Uh, so uh, the case summary would be a uh, 50 years old male without any comorbidity, he presented to us with complaint of multiple episodes of loose tooth vomiting along with renal dysfunction. It started improving following the institution of uh, uh, flu uh, IV fluids and other conservative me measures. But after three or four days, uh, he again had developed decreasing urine output, but at the same time there were signs of fluid overload like lower limb edema, lower limb swelling, shortness of breath, cough with scanty sputum, and the renal parameters have worsened to such extent that uh, he was initiated on uh, hemodialysis. So, uh, okay, we'll stop there. We don't stop there. You've done your job. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> now, when I come this side, it's so much better. Where right? we can see. Come in the front, please come in the front. <coughs> So she said, presented a very interesting case. Who will analyze the history? Uh, Yola, from which year? On DMP? Second. Second. Okay, you analyze this history. So, what do you think happened in the first part of the history? Uh, the rest are told. Uh, by so, no, so. And there was a history of some multiple episodes of uh, like going back uh, before admission 25 days back. There was a history of uh, uh, multiple episodes of loose tools as well as vomiting 
and that led to derangement in the kidney, kidney function test also. So at that time, likely the cause which uh, caused the acute kidney injury was related to something pre-renal uh, hyperperfusion. So, what is it that made you suspect pre-renal? So, as there was a uh, there was uh, a number of multiple episodes of loose cells and vomiting. Okay. And then even uh, so in the history there was that uh, there was slight improvement in the KFT when the patient was given IV fluids. So response to fluids. <laughs> then third thing. What else made you suspect pre -reading? Improvement in kidney function. Creatine improved. Okay. So the way she presented the first part appears to be some AKI, secondary to whatever, fluid deprivation, secondary to sepsis, we don't know. But it improved with fluid. Then what happened after that? So, uh, after that, uh, like when, he, when the patient was given IV fluid treatment, he developed uh, fluid, fluid overload status as there was swelling in the legs as well as he started developing dyspnea associated with cup. So you think it was fluid overload? Okay, pulmonary edema. But then why did the creatinine worsen? Sir, so maybe the uh, underlying sepsis must not have improved. That would have led to... Uh, Could it be a second hit of something? If a patient comes to you with edema, comes to you with a rising creatinine, and with signs of say fluid overload, what type of kidney disease would you suspect? First and what type, we may be totally wrong, but we are only going by our history. The first kidney disease, what did you suspect? You suspected AKI, possibly renal, possibly mild AT and we don't know. No? The second, if you are given this history, what would you suspect? Sir, so, IRGM infective. You would think of an infected glomerular nephritis occurring in this patient. So what is, let's see her diagnosis. <coughs> Uh, my provisional diagnosis, syndromic diagnosis after history taking in order of preference for uh, acute kidney injury. Second is the rapidly progressive renal failure, and third is the acute on chronic kidney disease. Yeah, so we agree with your diagnosis of acute kidney injury. We agree agree with RPG. Now, what's the difference between AKI and rapidly progressive renal failure? What is the difference? So uh, when we Conventionally, we talk of AKI, we talk of ATI. So, what is the difference between the two? Uh, in, sir, in AKI, is the uh, rapid rise in uh, rapid, dis, uh, rapid dysfunction and the kidney function. There is rapid rise in creatinine within 2 to 3 days of any. Uh, from hours to, from days. to days. Oh. Yeah. And rapidly progressive renal failure? From, sir, like around from 7 days to 2 from weeks. From days, days to weeks. weeks. So it is the time course which decides whether it is an AKI, ATN or it's an RPRF. Now why did she use this word acute and chronic kidney disease based on the history? Uh, sir, as is a 50 year old male, uh, so though there is no any comorbidity, but as the creatinine is 4 mg, so... Up. What is the... Definition of chronic kidney disease. Uh, sir, it is uh, abnormality in either kidney structure or function that uh, persisted for more than three months. So we don't know in this. So probably I will not uh, use this. No, you definite definition wise this is. Uh, not definition wise it is not, but uh, there is a possibility. But why did you think of it? No diabetes, no hypertension, perfectly all right. Develops loose motions. So CKD comes here already. I was just consulting the age factor. Okay. Sometimes there is no none specific symptoms. Uh, so so whenever you present based on history, based only on the history, don't bring in the findings into this. Okay. So uh, acute on we <coughs> will not be so one of the two. Okay. Can anyone think of anything else? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so she says that the first episode may be ATIN. That's why now the term used is ATIN and not AIN or ATN. 
because any of the drugs could be causing this tubular distension nephritis. But the odd feature is the edema, the hypertension. Now, urine findings are very important at this stage, which I'm sure she will tell us. So, what we do, you don't present everything. Let them ask what they want to see. Yes, your which year? First year. Sir. First year, okay. You, you people are second. Third year. Sir. Oh, great. Now, you ask her, what do you want to see next? Uh, urine routines. Show them the urine routine. Sir, shall I proceed with a general examination or shall I proceed with the okay, after the examination, you will show them the urine routine. On general examination, patient is conscious oriented to time, place, and person. Built in average. Uh, weight is around 73 kg with BMI 22.2. Uh, vitals were normal. Beyond, there is no any postural hypotension. And at the time of presentation, his BP was 120 by 70, that is measured in both arms. And there is no postural drop. Pulse is at the permanent, regular, normal in volume and character. There is no any radio radial or radio femoral delay. And all the peripheral pulses were palpable. However, his SpO2 is around 90% uh, at the room here. Uh, there is uh, no petal clubbing, terrace jaundice, cyanosis present. Only uh, the significant finding in general examination is the edema that is uh, present bilaterally. It was fitting tight and it is present till uh, uh, both knees. Then on general examination is on inspection. Uh, first, I higher examined the respiratory system. On inspection, uh, the bilateral symmetrical chest is there. However, the decrease there is decreased chest movement bilaterally. On percussion, there is no any tenderness. On percussion, there is stony dullness over the right infraspinal, infraaxillary, and inframammary region bilaterally, which is more extensive towards the right side. On auscultation, there is a decreased breast sound. On uh, central uh, cardiovascular examination, uh, there is the uh, uh, normal precording is there, and the on palpation, the apex beat is present at the fifth and the corset space, uh, one central medial to the mid clavicular line. There is no any additional uh, added sound like murmur or any pericardial drug. For abdomen examination, flank fullness is there on infection, and the umbilicus is inverted. There is no any organomegaly or tenderness. On percussion, there is a dull node present in the flanks and sifting dullness is present there. Bowel sound is present but it is sluggish. Our CNS examination is normal. So, uh, after physical examination also, my provisional syndrome diagnosis would be acute kidney injury and uh, RPRF. And I excluded acute on chronic kidney So, have you added anything? by general physical examination or general examination, has it added to your diagnosis? Uh, so there is uh, no pella. No, has it added to your no, diagnosis? Positive, there were few positive. Uh, sir, hypertension, uh, BP is normal, there is no hypertension. There is no pella, so there is no, basically anemia is not there. Plus... Uh, so what if she added to good history taking? In the history taking, she said that the patient was breathless, and here she found evidence of pleural effusion. She found fetal edema. So she has not added anything. So that's what is nephrology. Good history taking will probably, and a urine examination will give you most of the diagnosis. Okay. You know, when the uh, examiner wants to catch you on a physical finding, I would catch you on your word infra memory. You have infra axillary, you have infra scapular, but where is the infra memory? So that, uh, in the entire part of the chest is examined, that it is supraclavicular, infra clavicular, memory, and infra memory. memory. Okay. Okay. Uh, now we proceed with the investigations. On hemogram, the hemoglobin and platelet were normal. However, they increase in total uh, real, uh, total count that is 23.4 and in DLC uh, there is neutrophila and eosinophile counts were normal. Uh, serum creatinine on, at the time of presentation was 8 mg normal electrolytes. Total protein 6.4 along with normal albumin. Uh, coagulation parameters were normal. Uh, the CKD MD parameters were assessed and more or less they were uh, within normal limit except vitamin D level. On a routine urine examination, uh, it was... Yeah, uh, now you can stop. Yes, madam. She is giving you the urine routine. Now, where are we? 
He has RBCs in his urine. So, um, good. He's got RBCs. But there are no cast. I would, but still, there are so RBCs. Uh, I would still. Con uh, there, there are urine RBCs. Urine is also uh, 24 hour urine routine, only 500 milligrams. It's point. It's uh, 400. 400 milligrams, yes. 24 hours. Nephrotic. Is it a nephrotic? It's a nephrotic. It is not nephrotic. Not is it an RPGM? It could be RPG. Why do you say RPGM? Because RBCs are still there and subnephrotic proteinuria, he has edema. And there is proteinuria, proteinuria and edema. Okay. Edema. Could it be an ATIM? Yeah. It can be so. Sometimes. So hypertension is Usually, unusual. Unusual. So I that's why she's bringing in CKD again and again into the picture, probably because of hypertension, and she's in fine hypertension. Is that right? Yes, sir. Huh? Yes, sir. Yeah. So that finding of high, he was not a non-hypertensive. No, he was non. Uh, he was a non. He was a non-hypertensive. <laughs> yeah, but she's fine. History of hypertension, so she said, could it be CKD, could it be CKD? There is no, so there is no history, only uh, one time there is rise in PP at that time. So the patient was never in hypertension. He was hypotensive. Hypotensive. Okay. Hypotensive. So it still could be ATI. It, it still could be RPGN. Generally in RPGN you would expect more RBCs. You would expect more proteinuria if there is so much of edema which has come up, which has not happened in this yes. individual. So now we are dealing between an ATI and versus yes, RPG. Now we want to distinguish the two. Clinically, how would you distinguish ATI and versus RPG? Sir, like one, one thing is that hypertension only that I would say that's a normal. Then sir, edema, clinically if we are finding edema then we consider the RPG. Like in you can find it also protein only you may be Okay. Uh, who will tell me can you tell me the syndromes that we deal with in uh, kidney disease when we present a case of like she has presented? What are the syndromes in nephrology practice? Anybody? Yeah. Nephrotic, uh, nephritic, acute kidney injury, chronic kidney disease, hypertens hypertensive diseases, calcular, renal calcular diseases, isolated urinary findings, uh, RT renal tubular acid acidosis, interstitial uh, diseases, and. Uh, so, whenever you present a case in nephrology, we have these seven eight syndromes. UTI. We have these seven eight syndromes. So, first thing is. You must try to fit it, if you can, into one of these syndromes where it is possible. That's what she has done. She says it is a rapidly progressive renal failure. And she is trying to fit it into one of the syndromes. So which syndrome do you think your patient is going into? Uh, so from history, examination and uh, investigation finding, uh, I would like to go with uh, AKI first. Okay, let's there is possibility of RPR, but the, uh, my differential diagnosis would be uh, acute kidney injury. Okay, who will tell me the definition of AKI? Who can tell me the KDO classification of AKI? Yeah. Rise in serum by 0.3 per deciliter. How many grades are there? So, so three grades as per KDO. So okay. Uh, definition is rise in fiat of 0.3 mg per deciliter over, for, over 48 hours or uh, more than 50% uh, 1.5 times uh, uh, increase in creatinine over 7 days or a urine output decrease of uh, 0.5 ml per kg per hour for So there hours. are two criteria, creatinine based and urine, urine output based. based. Now, suppose there is a discordance between the two criteria, which one would you select? Discordance means the urine output is not there, but the creatinine has not risen. You would take the higher grade, whether it's the urine output, then you take the urine output as your grade of AKI. 
What is the difference between KDGO AKI versus AKIM criteria or rifle criteria? So AKIM said that the increase in point three milligram deciliter or one point five times should occur over forty eight hours. Whereas KDGO defined a point three milligram over forty eight hours and one point five times over seven days. So the time. AKIM stuck to forty eight hours and they said onset could be forty eight hours. But up to seven days, and what about the rifle criteria? The rifle used GFR. Uh, so the <coughs> moved by what is the problem? Why did we do away with rifle? Sir, rifle is criteria is asked for a baseline zero, <coughs> which is not possible. And where baseline criteria was not available, they said go by the MPRP definition of GFR of seventy six. As the baseline, which may be incorrect in cases of CKD, you may not have such a high GFR. Okay, so as for KD, go where does your patient fit in? Stage three, sir. Stage three because dialysis. So it is stage three, acute kidney injury. Okay. So serology we are done. Uh, virus markers were negative. ANA by IF was negative. DSGN is negative. NTPR3 and MPONK is negative. Anti-GM antibody is negative. Uh, C3, C4 were normal. Ultrasound revealed bilateral normal kidneys with CMD maintained. Liver spleen were normal. HRCT revealed no any consolidation. It was just suggestive of load overload. Uh, Eco revealed LVF of 40 to 45 percent. There is no RWMA and there is no any uh, vegetation that is suggestive of infective endocarditis. So uh, till now uh, we have ruled out uh, CKD, uh, RPGM causes that is anti-GBM disease and associated vasculitis. Immune complex diseases like lupus nephritis, C3GN, post infectious GN, IE, cryoglobulinemia, MPGN associated with HP and HP severe ruled out. A TMA, there is a uh, major vas uh, renal vascular event were also ruled out. And the post renal causes of AKI were also ruled out till now. Yeah. How do you say you have excluded? One, 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 one. How did you exclude immune complex? <laughs> Uh, sir, in lupus nephritis, uh, the complements level will be low. What happens in post-infectious glomerular nephritis? Uh, sir, uh, C3 will be low. However, C4 will be uh, normal, sir, in post-infectious GM. So, without a kidney biopsy, I would still not exclude mm -hmm. a post-infectious? Uh, major reasons. In the sense in that, the so, this is a very interesting thing. When you get a case of glomerular nephritis, how do you approach a case of glomerular nephritis based on IF findings, based on kidney histology, IF findings, pathophysiology? How do you approach? Okay, we'll come to it when we reach the biopsy. As to how do you, anyone knows the new proposed classification of glomerular nephritis? It is proposed, not yet accepted. So when we come to the kidney, then I will tell you what is the new proposed classification. So I just wanted to know, clear the rule. You have ruled out CKD on what are the three parameters that you ruled out? Sir, in ultrasound, the kidney size is very normal. Right. Uh, second is sir, uh, there is no hypertension. Clinical grounds uh, there is no. Uh, Proteinuria is no anemia. Less no anemia is there. In protein is twelve. And CKD and parameters were also uh, within normal limits. So. And there is no any history wise. There is no any history of nocturia along with other non-specific symptoms uh, that pro that's a very suggestive of uh, uremia. In the I mean lab test, cryogenic no, was was negative. Yes. They did a cryogenic test. Thank you. Sir, we proceed with biopsy. What is the TMA? Sir, TMA, uh, there is, but uh, nothing is suggestive of TMA. Uh, means peripheral is normal, hemoglobin normal, platelet normal, 
vitals. But we have okay, okay. He know uh, that uh, BP is also normal. There is no any history of fever. Uh, Radiation normal. The history that she gave us could it have been a post infectious DMA? So now we have come to three possibilities based on history. One is ATN, ATI, ATN. Drug induced ATIN, you got a lot of drugs including ciprofloxacin. Because it is post diarrhea, you must always think of post diarrhea, HUS or TMA. No, post infectious TMA we must think of. And anything else we could think of? If the history is to be believed, what you told us, that he became all right and then it started rising. That is something I am not able to sort of figure out unless some drug has affected him at that time. If it was on the over a longer period of time, we know that crescent formations can take place in the kidney. So a crescentic transformation or whatever leading to secondary rise in renal parameters. Okay. Cell and proceed with biopsy uh, on light microscopy. Uh, there were 12 lomeri, none of them is sclerosed. Uh, there is no significant proliferative or exudative activity, no glomerular capillary thickening. There is no evidence of segmental sclerosis, patient formation, tough necrosis, or intracapillary thrombi, or any congophilic deposits in the visualized glomeruli. Uh, now, the tubular interstitial compartment uh, there is tubular atrophy and interstitial, interstitial fibrosis, which is less than 10%. Tubules show prominent cytoplasmic macular changes along with evidence of severe acute tubular injury with epithelial simplification and loss of blood bot uh, breast borders. There are hyaline casts as well as coarse granular casts which slug epithelial cells in the tubular lumen. Uh, multifocal interstitial inflammation and eosinophils forming the areas of tubulitis and significant interstitial edemas there. Uh, arterial source only focal vacuolization. So, uh, no, my final diagnosis would be uh, acute kidney injury due to severe ATN that is secondary to hypoperfusion uh, due to acute gastroenteritis. Uh, there is possibility of infection plus there is sepsis induced card cardiolinus syndrome that may lead to hypoperfusion and severe ATN. Cardiolinus? How did cardiolinus step in? Actually, sir, uh, there is decrease in e ejection fraction at that time when the rise in serum creatinine is there. So the doctor has told the patient that uh, your cardiac How much function. Was the ejection fraction? Sir, he has not remembered the uh, value, but in our hospital it was around 40 to 45 percent. So there is a possibility. So actually, I would never keep a possibility of cardiorenal in this. What are the types of cardiorenal? You are which here? No, next to you. Third year, yeah. Tell me types of how many types of cardiac Five are there? types of cardiac yeah. syndrome. Uh, first, acute cardiac uh, syndrome. Uh, uh, acute cardiac problem leading to AKI. Uh, the class two is uh, chronic cardiac syndrome. Uh, chronic and uh, causes of card uh, cardiac failure leading to CKD. Uh, class three is uh, AKI leading to acute heart failure. Class 4 is uh, chronic diseases leading to uh, chronic heart failure and class 5 is both. Combined. Combined. So where do you think this will fit in? Class 3. So you think it is a kidney disease with a secondary cardiac involvement. So suppose the patient is actually in cardiac failure, what are the findings you would expect? Pulmonary edema. In the peripheral edema, yes. And on auscultation, uh, there will be basal cramps, uh, raised ZBP. She had pleural effusion, she mentioned that. And what about the duodenous pus? Raised. So, did she mention it was raised? No. Okay, and in the heart? Gallop rhythm. You'd expect an S3, a gallop rhythm. Okay. <coughs> The second diagnosis will be the acute tubular interstitial nephritis that may be due to drugs like PBI, fluoroquinolones, and penicillin group of drug that patient has received uh, in that hospital for uh, infection and second is the infection. Sir. Okay. You are going to tell us the course or you are going to stop here? So there are, uh, we mentioned, I mentioned this management part. No, we will stop here. Let's now 
analyze this case history, we have analyzed enough. Now let's go on to some theoretical question. So when the patient comes to you with acute kidney injury, how do you evaluate the function of the kidney? What do we do in chronic kidney disease? What are the what do we use? We use serum creatinine and we use formulas to tell us what is the GFR. We want to know the GFR. So in an acute kidney injury, how do we do it? Is are the formulas accurate? Why not? Your third year? Okay, tell me why the formulas are not accurate? Because they were based on steady state with serum creatinine. And we cannot measure the GFR in an acute kidney injury. We cannot use radioisotope methods to have the eGFR. So there is something known as a kinetic GFR, which you can use in acute kidney injury. <coughs> What is the problem with creatinine measurement in acute kidney injury? So we can't use the formulas, we don't have kinetic GFRs, we cannot do actual GFR estimation. So then what is the problem with creatinine? I'm sure you know. What do you think is the problem with creatinine? Very good. So, creatinine lags behind the worsening of kidney function. So, it takes time for the creatinine to start rising. That is one. What is the second problem? Since you said one, you can tell me what is the second problem. So, in sarcopenic states, you may not get a rise of creatinine proportional to the renal dysfunction or to the GFR. So what can we use? Can we use cystatin? You are saying no, why not? So it can be used, but even cystatin depends upon a steady state. So that is the problem about measuring the GFR in acute kidney injury. We still don't have a reliable marker. So when we are talking about markers, do we have biomarkers that can predict? Can you name some biomarkers? Kidney injury molecule 1. Okay, which is the one which is most commonly used in clinical practice? And NGAM is one. Just first mention them. One is NGAL, <coughs> second is KIM, <coughs> then insulin. You have heard of TIM, yeah? TIM and insulin growth factor binding protein. So, all these markers have been approved by FDA. But what is the problem with these markers? What do they indicate? <laughs> yeah. In other words, they indicate early tubular injury when the AKI is in grade 1 and they predict who is going to go on to grade 2 and grade 3. But then what is the problem? Why aren't we using these markers? No, they are available. The NGAP is available. There is a kit. NGAP kit. We are routinely using it. Because there can be a non specific rise in the presence of sepsis mm -hmm. that she had and inflammation like this patient had. So we still don't know where to incorporate it in our clinical practice. So in cases of cardiac surgery, where a clean patient is coming in for CABG, you can estimate these markers and predict who is going to go on to acute kidney injury. So these are the markers you must know early markers of tubular injury. Okay. You all have, anyone has used these tubular markers? No. Okay. Now when you get a case of AKI like this person was presented, how do you approach, how should you approach a case of AKI? Patient has had gastroenteritis, 
is gone into hypertension, had kidney injury. For some reason, he recovered. All those reports were done in your hospital? No. no. So, we don't know. He may not have recovered because this course is something very unusual. But let's say he recovers. Now, when you get a case of acute injury, what would you think of? How would you approach? <coughs> First thing in your mind is can I reverse? Can I reverse what is reversible? So now you tell me what is it that you can reverse? Pre renal. Very good. Post renal. Obstructive. So you can exclude pre renal, you can exclude post renal, and then come to intrinsic renal disease. In intrinsic renal disease, what can you reverse? Drug yeah, yeah. No, let's go. If you give ciproflox and it causes ATIN, that you can't reverse. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you come halfway through, which are the yes. drugs which you can reverse? The use of common use decrolimus, NSAIDs, ACE inhibitors. So, these are the ones which call functional abnormalities in the blood supply to the kidney, which you can reverse mm. right so first thing comes to your mind let me look for reversible factors mm. <coughs> and then of course intrinsic renal disease because of drugs or because of tma or because of whatever reason that you would like to reverse so let's come to the first part fluids mm. you want to exclude pre renal so you give fluids now what would be the choice of before choice how will you monitor how much fluid to give IVC status. IVC status clinically and other than that you can So what do you see clinically? Skin, 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 skin okay. what, what about the monitoring? What are the other invasive <coughs> monitoring tools that we have? C Central renal special. One is CVP. Then is? Uh, right atrium. Right pressure. Okay, so many artery, artery pressures. One more thing, central venous oxygenation. No? But in the new trials which have been published, it has been found that it really doesn't help because these are static parameters. Mm -hmm. And in AKI, they keep on, sepsis in AKI, they keep on changing. Mm -hmm. So they really don't help in your fluid assessment. Your fluid assessment has to be done clinically. What type of fluid would you choose? What are the types of fluid you know? Let somebody yeah, let the lady next to you answer something. Huh? Tell me what type of fluids are you aware of? So crystalloids like Nordicline, Ringer, Ringer, okay. Hypotonic saline, isoline. You have crystalloids and colloids. colloids. In colloids, what you have? And hydroxy, ethyl, starch. So now, and you also have something known as balanced solutions, no? yes. physiological solutions. Now, yes. what would you choose? Mr. Let the person behind say. Now, tell me what would your which here? Great. So, what would you choose? You choose a crystalloid. Okay, and in crystalloids, what would you choose? So, there is no consensus on which is the best fluid to use, but by and large, it is normal saline. I don't think you should call it normal saline because it is not normal. It is 0.9% sodium chloride solution. What is the problem in using saline? Sodium. What is the strength of sodium in? Compared to balanced solutions where it is about 140. When the patient has diarrhea, what type of acidosis does he develop? He develops hypochloric metabolic acidosis. And here you are giving him more chloride. chloride. So that is what you have to watch out for. 
that there may be a widening chloride level. Chloride levels would be going up because you are using cyanide. Okay. Shall I deviate a little from this from her case? Yes. Huh? On this this aspect. Okay. How do you distinguish hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis from a large anion gap metabolic acidosis? This patient may have got acidosis also. No? He may have actually developed sepsis, acidosis and diarrhea. Now you are saying it is large anion gap metabolic acidosis. She is saying there is diarrhea so it is a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Suppose I tell you both are there, then how do you find out if both are there? Coexisting. Metabolic acidosis with normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. So what is the delta delta gap? Between the anion gap divided by Change in the bicarbonate. Normally it should be 1. No, whatever that falls by 1, this should also fall by 1. So when there is a large delta delta gap so the delta gap does it increase or decrease it becomes large the delta gap no it becomes more than what you can expect so this you must keep in mind when we are talking about abgs anyhow we deviated from the topic coming back to fluids so we discussed about the fluids, we discussed about creatine stages of AKI that are there and we discussed about the, uh, <coughs> the definitions, rifle versus AKI versus the KDGO guideline. Uh, while she was speaking, I was trying to make a note as to what else we could ask. Yes, very important. What is the role of a diuretic when he came with drop in urine output? Uh, what is the role of frusamide in an acute kidney injury? What is the role of frusamide? Preventing <laughs> Why do we all use frusamide? There has to be a role, no? that's why we are using. So, what is the role of frusamide? Okay, what is fluid challenge? So, given bolus, there is an increase in urine output of more than. So, frusamide is used as a stress test. Unlike in cardiac practice, you have the troponins, the troponamide, CPKMB. And whole lot of new things, whole host of new things coming up in nephrology. Unfortunately, there is nothing beyond creatinine. So you use frusamide as a stress test. Now, what are you trying to check when you give frusamide? Urine. You are trying to check if you give a bolus of frusamide, does the urine output increase? If it increases, you know that there is a significant pre-renal element. So you must continue giving fluids along with frusamide. Now, what dose do you give? You must actually go on to your favorite practice with this. If the patient has not used diuretic before than 1 mg per kg of Very good. And what do you monitor? You will not be able to do 200 ml in next two hours. Hours. over the next two hours. If it happens, you know there is a significant pre mm -hmm. Now he asked a question. Does it change the prognosis of the patient? Yes. Suppose you have an oliguric AKI and a non-oliguric AKI secondary to frusamide use. Does it change the prognosis? So it does not change the prognosis. But if at the onset the patient had come with non-oliuric AKI, that means it's a milder form of AKI. So these people do better than oliguric. But when you use frusamide stress test and they become non-oliguric, it does not change the prognosis. 
then what does it change? Management. Yeah, how does it change the management? So if the patient is not going to respond to diabetic, then you have to uh, switch to renal replacement. So, so it makes to... very good. It makes fluid management easier, mm -hmm. you no, know, by using fusum. Otherwise, it doesn't change the prognosis in people. Okay. Now this patient when he came in shock, can you go back to your slide, first slide? What were the pattern in your clinical findings on BP and all you were mentioning? Before he had developed hypertension? Um, when he came to us, uh, his BP was normal. Over there in that hospital? Uh, in that hospital it was lower than BP but exact uh, so is not. So what normal. is the blood pressure that you want to maintain in these people? The mean arterial pressure should be? More than 65. More than 65. Can it be 90? Can it be 60? Can it be 80? So, you maintain a mean arterial pressure in a naive person like this who doesn't have past history of hypertension or kidney disease at about 65 to 75. If it's a chronic kidney disease, a known hypertensive, you would keep it 10 millimeters higher, the mean arterial pressure. Okay, then just go down. When did you start dialysis? Uh, sir, in previous hospital, uh, he was initiated on hemodialysis as so there is no any uh, dialytic response and he is in low flow to state. And what was the correct name? Uh, the we don't know. So they started dialysis for the conventional Six. indication. Now, who can tell me the various trials which have looked at when to start dialysis? I'm sure you all are aware of it. Yeah, tell me, because one by one. A Kiki one, a Kiki two. Elaine trial. Idealize you. Idealize you. Start, start. Start. So these are five trials. <coughs> now, what did these five? We'll not go into uh, what pattern of patients they took, but leave out a Kiki two. What did the other trials show? No benefit of starting early that there was no benefit of starting early versus starting late. Now, what was early for them? Six hours. So, even when a patient reached stage two or stage three, within six to twelve hours, they started. And anything beyond that, they said it was late. So, we never follow that in our mm -hmm. practice. We don't go by this. So what do we do? We do what Akiki 2 says. Now what did Akiki 2 say? That there is one standard indication for starting dialysis. Let's ask the first tip. Yes ma'am. Sir, hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, oligurium, uh, uric acid. Hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, oligurium, fluid overload. Sir, fluid overload, uh, uric acid. So these are standard indications for starting dialysis. Now what did Akiki 2 say? Let's ask the third years. What did it what did Akiki what was the philosophy behind Akiki 2? They wanted to know how late is late. No? They said, okay, you are saying we should wait, but how much can we wait? So they took a cutoff. Of bun. Anyone can remember that bun cutoff? So they took a bun cutoff of 112. Why they chose, they didn't examine <laughs> in their trial, but they said 112 was late. And then for another group of patients, they waited till there was a standard indication or the bun crossed 120 or 22. Bun, mind you. So what did they find? <laughs> Any idea what they found? There was no difference, but 
the 90 day mortality <laughs> was lower when they started late and not very late. So they said there is no point in waiting for it to be very very late. You can start when it is late but don't start very very late because 90 day mortality was higher. Why do people with AKI die? Why do they die? Have you ever thought? Do they die of kidney disease? You started dialysis. So they die of the complications of acute kidney injury. That is, they die because of their effect on the heart, they die because of the effect on the brain, they die because of electrolyte imbalances. That is why these trials were designed. They said if AKI causes high mortality, let us start dialysis early. But they found that there was no difference. Okay, now when you stop dialysis, having started, when you stop, what do you do? Which hospital are you from? Yeah, tell me, when do you stop? So when the urine output in, uh, or the rate of rising serum creatinine slows down or uh, when the patient uh, starts having improvement in urine. So one is subjective, we are all deep. When do you stop? You are also from Vedanta? Yeah. So when do you stop? Um, once the creatinine is in a steady state and it starts uh, a downward trend. Why urine output improves and no uremic symptoms, patient is clinically doing better. So you so stop we, we when you give start giving trial of increasing the duration of dialysis and then slowly try to taper yes. and stop. So there is no consensus on how to decide. The simplest way is when the kidney function is such that it can support the body functions. One is by urine output, roughly, roughly more than 400 ml in 24 hours when the pH becomes more than 7.2 you know that now you probably can stop in your patient and the way you said so when to start when to stop these are the two very important things you know in ACAT right now let's know your course When the patient came to us, uh, he was in a uh, state of load overload with uh, normal TP, 120 by 70, along with a serum creatinine of 8. Uh, he was in state of uh, metabolic acidosis along with uh, decreased cardiac function, that is ejection fraction of 40 to 45 percent, along with a plural, bilateral pleural effusion that is uh, mild to uh, moderate to aggressive. So uh, he was initiated on uh, uh, hemodialysis sessions has been done. Three uh, sessions were done prior to biopsy and uh, after biopsy there is two more sessions required plus uh, he was given IV diuretic uh, for fluid overload following which he has uh, good response so after five sessions of hemodialysis uh, there is no any need of further dialysis sessions the metabolic acidosis initially was uh, managed by dialysis but later on he required intermittent uh, soda bike uh, uh, injections later which was shifted to uh, oral form can you go on the histology again? Uh, glomerular uh, compartment is normal yeah, yes. okay <coughs> go on to your treatment uh, yes sir after yes. Renal replacement therapy uh, uh, and uh, uh, managing its complications, managing the complications of load overload. When the final biopsy report came, means the LM and IF funding, uh, he was uh, given uh, basically, sir, prior to initiation of dialysis, he had already had good adequate response. Basically, his acute urinary necrosis phase was in it was in recovery phase. So. The creatinine has already started improving and there is improvement in urine output. So uh, we have not given him uh, IV solubidrol, rather we have initiated him on oral steroid only at the rate of 1 mg per kg body weight. So it's TMG uh, we have initiated. Okay, this, is, this is very interesting. <coughs> Does this explain your two hit hypothesis? 
Suppose I tell you this patient actually came with an ATM which was recovering and then was given some drugs which caused acute interstitial nephritis and the patient went into AKI and fluid overload. So this explains this curve that has happened, very unusual. But Initially when he was, uh, his BP was low due to that uh, fluid loss due to uh, gastroenteritis. At that time his creatinine was around uh, 7, 6, 7. Then it improves with fluid resuscitation. It was improved up to 4 and 3. At that time uh, he has some, his, his BP was around 140 to 150. So some uh, antihypertensive agent has been given at that time. Plus uh, he has developed, after that he has developed dizziness. So likely possibility of uh, hypotension is there at that time. Plus, uh, at the time, he also had developed after one to two days, fetal edema, shortness of breath, cough. So, he was given multiple IV antibiotics. So, there is possibility of persistent sepsis or uh, hospital acquired infection. So, infection and drugs. But both why do you say infection? Sir, oh, well, what was the, the WBC count? 23,000 at our hospital and in previous record, it was around 15,000 to 20,000. But any of the cultures, cultures in uh, negative. Cultures was no, negative. Negative. no was not that. Uh, at our hospital it was around twelve thirty, so it is high. And previously sir, they have not done. So you think this is post infectious acute tubular decision? Uh, post infectious plus superimposed with uh, drugs also. Decision mm -hmm. Plus he had taken ciprofloxacin during that uh, AG time. So there is an interval of around seven to ten days also. So. Yes, so what is the role of steroids in tubular distribution nephritis? When you go back today, you must read a C. Jassen article. I think it was 2018. How will I treat? You know, you have those case studies in C. Jassen. How will I treat? A case of acute interstitial nephritis is given, a lovely algorithm is given there. So now the role of steroids. Why didn't you pulse? There is no any uh, consensus that support the uh, role of steroid in the area. Many of them spontaneously recover. recover. Yeah. Uh, but sir, there is many there are many retrospective data that suggest that those patients uh, in whom the steroid has been started early so when they are follow up then there is uh, less chances of interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy so there is uh, less incidence of CKD or end stage disease in such patient in whom uh, steroid has been started early so uh, so retrospective data is only there sir Plus there is a praise trial. So there is no consensus on giving pulse versus 1 mg per kg of steroids. There is no consensus whether they should give 4 weeks, 6 weeks, 8 weeks. But suppose this patient had not responded, then what do you have? Most likely uh, we will give uh, pulse steroids. No. So there are case series where they will use other immunosuppression other than steroids in these people. For example, if your patient is a diabetic and he develops acute tubular interstitial nephritis and with steroids he develops psychosis or worsening of diabetes, then what did you use? Uh, the agents, steroids. That's what he Steroids. <coughs> you can use steroid sparing immunosuppression. In the biopsy, are there any prognostic indicators that your patient may not respond to steroids? So that interstitial uh, fibrosis and tubular atrophy, but it is uh, less than 10% in our case. Yeah. So it is not that significant. And when there are large number of plasma cells, this is a poor prognostic indicator. Okay then. And sir, so, uh, we are discharging on uh, around 40 mg, 40 mg per kg uh, uh, per day. Sorry, 40 mg per day steroid. Which was which patient has taken for two weeks. After two weeks, the dose has been reduced to uh, 30 mg, and then after two weeks, it was reduced to 10 mg, and then stopped. 
during this trend, uh, during this follow period, uh, at the time of Vishal is trading was two, and gradually when he came for uh, follow, there is a declining trend of the serum creatinine. And after about uh, eight weeks, the serum creatinine level has reached up two point nine only, and his vitals were adequate, and there is no any uh, signs of fluid or not or any other. Can you pinpoint any drug specific drug out of the top or likely? So first is that ciprofloxacin. Uh, second is the PPI. Uh, third is the uh, actually he is not told, but his documentation is showing that he has received prescription as a weapon. So penicillin group of drugs there. Plus, uh, I think he has uh, he has received meropenem also. These three are ciprofloxacin, uh, PPI, and uh, penicillin group of drugs. What is the advice you want to give to him for the any other illness next time? Okay. <coughs> Uh, as he had already. Uh, or a photo of long term photo. So, uh, first is the BP measurement, second is the protein urea estimation, and third is to avoid that certain group of drugs uh, like uh, this NSAIDs and particularly this antibiotics. So, you treated for around 8 weeks, that is the mm -hmm. specific time. And any follow up on the investigations that you have? So, we have repeated routine urine and uh, urine protein creatinine ratio, and it was normal. Urine protein is uh, bland, and the UV series is also common to one. Is AKIs mostly, I mean, complete recoveries are there, but are they likely to get uh, CKD in their long term follow up? Yes. How, what is the I mean, possibilities of percentage? No, 40 percent. No. So AKIs, recovered AKIs, as per you, will get 40% of them will have CKD. So I don't know the percentages, but yes, can anyone trace the course of AKI? What are the types of AKI courses that you know of? This patient had AKI, creatine went up came down, recovered. This is the traditional teaching of AKI. But is there any other course you know of AKI? It may not completely recover and the baseline might... It may not reach the baseline. Reach the baseline, the baseline and, uh, okay, good. The okay. Uh, patient will be in dialysis different. It might not recover. He may progress so, to CK. Suppose this patient had not... Forget the histology. This patient was on dialysis and did not recover. Six weeks or eight weeks down the time. What would you start suspecting? Uh, there is possibility of uh, chronic tubular interstitial nephritis. No, no. A patient has come with acute kidney injury and you started dialysis. And he is too ill for you to do a biopsy. So you wait for eight weeks hoping that the kidney opens up. It doesn't open up, then what do you suspect? So there is possibility of FSGS. No, those are glomerular diseases. We are talking about acute. I am taking you away from what you have read. That's why you are getting lost now. Let's ask Particle you. Necrosis. Yeah, so you suspect it's the most severe form of acute kidney injury causing acute cortical necrosis. What are the non-invasive methods of diagnosing acute cortical necrosis? CT scan will show us. Show us what? Halo, halo, ring, ring, ring sign, ring sign. Ring sign and later on calcification. Calcification. So this is acute cortical. And what you see on a biopsy in acute cortical necrosis? Ghost. Cells. Ghost. You see yes. for ghost. ghost. Have you all seen acute cortical necrosis biopsy? You can't see the glomerulite. <coughs> they are all like ghost cells. Everything is pink. On the histopathological examination. Okay, so we were talking about the courses of AK. One is going up, improving. One is going up, 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 up. It doesn't improve at all. Any other course? It may improve and then again start worsening. These are the cases who go on to chronic kidney disease that he was asking. So AKI is not a benign condition like we once thought of. Okay.
when you suspect an alternate etiology in an acute tubular necrosis based on your clinical finding and urine analysis. So there is possibility of RPG and if you not if you have not done the surgery only no from my his... my question is this patient has come with dehydration shock acute kidney injury we think of acute tubular necrosis when will you think of an alternative to acute tubular necrosis sir if he has received any nephrotoxin drugs based on your examination and urine analysis you you actually you frame your you know that you were telling me okay now man let's ask someone from the yeah all three are you from the tantra b l k pur hard tell me so you and think of you think of alternative diagnosis if there is hematuria if there is protein you know yeah okay you're coming clinically first okay if there is pekikia no then you think of alternate diagnosis or if you find joint or if you find there is jaundice then you think of alternate diagnosis yeah you think of alternate diagnosis and on urine examination if you find Um, more number of RBCs or RBC casts. Yeah, RBCs, RBC casts, and protein. Protein urea. You think of alternate diagnosis. Okay, now this person came with diarrhea and acute kidney injury. Besides hypovolemic shock or sepsis, AKI, you must keep TMA in mind. Mm-hmm. Now, how do you classify TMAs? Yes. hereditary acquired and congenital primary secondary primary secondary secondary due to secondary due to transplant malignancy bone marrow transplant infection infection malignancy autoimmune disorders malignancy malignancy transplant transplant and primary yeah. due to genetic and genetic genetic okay so how would you suspect a tma in your patient uh on clinical basis uh, so there is a history of real pain or uh, any infection most likely gi infection then fever uh, worsening renal parameters and uh, microangiopathy hemolytic anemia so in hemogram uh, we'll see uh, decrease hemoglobin and platelet count along with in peripheral smear uh, we'll look for uh, fragmented rbcs uh, then liver function will re- uh, reveal uh, indirect hyperbilirubinemia there will be uh, raised ldh okay good so now your patient has come with diarrhea and has got tma right platelet is down to 60000 will you do pheresis or no what is the role of plasma pheresis in tm sir if it is diarrhea induced and we will go for plasma pheresis if it is atypical if it is anything induced other than adenitis 13 deficiency there is no role of plasma pheresis But then, why do we do one plasma pheresis? Because by the time we get a report, we uh, do start um, uh, the treatment. In many cases, if we are suspecting, uh, and most of the times, if it is uh, due to antibodies, uh, which is the most common scenario, that can be removed with plasma pheresis. If it is only due to, we'll come to that. We'll come to that later. So, if there is an adenitis thirteen deficiency. the treatment is plasma pheresis why it is the normal 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 acting at mks 13 and remove the intermediate macro molecules which are damaging the endothelium and your plasma plasma will be normal on the brain factor 
Okay, so the turnaround time now for Adventist 13 deficiency is about 6 hours if you do it in Kangara. Okay. This has got a two hit hypothesis. Many of the people are underlying Adventist 13 deficiency and they develop a superimposed injury. That is why we do one till we get the report. Now you are talking about antibodies. What antibodies are you talking about? Serine atypical uh, achilles. Yeah, very good. It, what antibodies you are talking about? Um, against factor 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 H. H. Yeah. against complement factor H, which is the most common word. H and I. H, I, H, I, I. I. So these are auto antibodies to these inhibitory factors. Right, that's why plasma pheresis may remove help these in removing these antibodies, and that's why immunosuppression may help in these. Right, I think we had a fairly comprehensive discussion of AKI. Is there anything else in AKI that we should be discussing? Only three, four we discussed. Uh, uh, the thing about the cystatin C. Yeah. Okay, yeah. What do you want to know about cystatin C? You tell me. What is cystatin C? This is how it is done. Is it available and what are the pros and cons? Let's ask the. Who? No, Medanta is there. You are from? Gangara. Huh? Gangara. Ah, you tell me. Tell. Cystatin C. In your hospital, adult test 13 is being done? Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> 6 hours, turn around time. Now you tell me about cystatin C. Yes. So cystatin C is a product of all nucleated cells. It is excreted freely in the glomerular and it is absorbed in the tubules. So what cystatin it is destroyed in the tubules, I'm sorry, not absorbed, it is metabolized by the tubules. So in people who are sarcopenic, who have low body mass, where creatinine is fallacious, you can do cystatin. And this is being done routinely in all labs. It's being done in NAL, it's being done in SRL, it's being done in Gangaram, Medanta also must be doing cystatin C. It's also so it is being done routinely in Delhi cystatin levels. The advantage of doing cystatin levels is when suppose you get a very muscular person, like I had a 104 kilo weight lifter, creatinine of 1.3, and he was dubbed as CKB. So when we did the cystatin clearance, it was normal for him. Or when you get an amputee with acute kidney injury or with any kidney disease and you don't know what is the GFR, the creatinine is going to be fallacious. Then you do cystatin. Does it have any uh, special role in pregnancy? Why do you ask? No, I have never thought about it because I know it is an alternate marker to creatinine. It is not without its own fallacies. But it is more sensitive than creatinine as a marker of GFR. So if you open your app, you'll have got the app on GFR app on your smartphones. Just open it. And look at how do you calculate GFR? EGFR calculators by NKF. Just open it. So there is a cystatin there also and there is a combination of cystatin and creatinine because cystatin itself can have some fallacies. But it's been done routinely. If you want to do it, it can be done in any of these labs. Okay, I think we've had a long discussion on AKI fluids. So what are, what are you going back, what have you learned from this class and what are you going back with, what impression? Yes madam from Gangara, let me see, only then I will ask Ashwini that what did you learn? You are also from Gangara? Yeah, tell me. 
सर वी हैव टू फर्स्ट कैटेगराइज एक ही आई वेदर इट इज प्री रीनल रीनल और पोस्ट रीनल एक ही आई लुक फॉर रिवर्सिबल फैक्टर्स ऑफ द फैक्टर्स देन देन वी हैव टू ट्राई एंड असेस द कॉज ऑफ एक ही आई ओके एंड बिसाइड्स हिस्ट्री व्हाट इज द मोस्ट इंपोर्टेंट फाइंडिंग is the urine examination no it's a part of clinical examination actually urine examination in nephrology okay then then the fluid management of ATI okay. then we discussed how to distinguish ATI and ATI and versus RPGM yes no versus glomerular disease <coughs> then we discussed the role of steroids in ATI then we discussed the course of ATI okay. so in the very atypicality then you look for other slides like, like This was a atypical presentation that ATI was recovery, and, and the then hit. there was a another episode, another hit, another set. Conversation of BAI and ATI. Uh, I had one more question regarding the phases of ATIs. First is the initiation, then generally maintenance, and then recovery. So does does that uh, one phase extensive phase? So that does this phase come after uh, that initiation phase in every case? इनिशियन Yeah, so so this maintenance. Uh, then the, there is extensive phase. Is there any extensive phase or word like this? There are three phases that there. Because in some articles it has been seen, uh, in, it has been written that initiation phase first. Then there is the uh, maintenance okay. phase in which uh, the ongoing sepsis or hypoperfusion so, phase has been prolonged. Yes. Like in this case, for example, if the sepsis has been there but it has not improved. So is there any extension? Of that initiation phase, means I had the initiation. Have you heard that word extension? Mm -hmm. First is the initiation, then maintenance, then recovery. Actually, I was also thinking of these three phases, but in one article I was studied this extensive phase. So that means the same thing that the maintenance phase is continuing more than two to three weeks. It is prolonged as long as the injury, whatever caused the injury, has not been removed. The maintenance phase prolongs. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. You didn't go for a plan. New proposed classification for yeah. Yeah. So this uh, normally when we classify glomerular nephritis, we first start with the immunofluorescence. We say is it linear staining, is it granular staining, or there is no staining. If there is no staining, we think of we think of or see you. If there is linear, we think of anti-GGM, and if there is granular, we think of immune, immune complex. Yes. Then we further divide the immune complex into infection, autoimmune, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But now we know that one histology can be caused by many diseases, and one disease can cause many histologies. So it's very confusing when you try to interpret. So the new classification. Let me see. It talks about how I remembered was PAP. Papa. It talks about pathophysiology. What is the pathophysiology of the disease? Is it infection related? Is it autoimmune related? Is it alloimmune? He has brought in a concept of alloimmune. Is it myeloma related? He has given it a special topic and one more, whether cancer or one more topic he has given. So. is spoken about pathophysiology from this pathophysiology then they go on to straight into the kidney they do not talk about histology and then they talk about serology is anca positive is anti gbm positive is ana positive and then the acute the kidney injury is it acute or chronic don't bother about histology suppose there is a autoimmunity suppose you find ana positive and if the patient has got an acute kidney injury going on it says you must treat this is still being refined it says you must treat 
if there are features of chronicity on histology, then don't do it. Then continue managing as CKD. So what they are trying to say is that this has not yet been accepted. Published in NDT 2023, one of the uh, articles has given this classification only because of the confusion which is created on histology. We are trying to first see histology and then see the disease. Here he is saying see the disease, see the markers and then see if the histology is acute, then treat according to histology. If it is chronic, then don't treat. So I can give you the reference. In fact, if you wanted to just pick it up, uh, newer classification of glomerulonephritis, NGT 2023, you will come up with it. I must be having it on my Twitter also. In fact, a lot of learning is done through Twitter nowadays. No? Do you all see Twitter? No. You all don't see Twitter? You all will learn. If you just go through Twitter, follow the correct people on Twitter. <laughs> no, I'll just tell you. So, I followed this young girl from PGI Chandigarh and she came up, here's the one, she said, so when you blood and urine test for suspected glomerulonephritis, this is a new classification of glomerulonephritis I'm telling you, is it infection related, is it autoimmunity related, is it transplant, is it systemic inflammation or is it MGUS? Then you look at the immunotyping, what I told you, look at PCR, serologies, look at autoantibodies, look at donor specific, look at complement and look at free light chains. Then you go to the kidney biopsy and see what you are finding in the kidney biopsy. If there is activity, control it. If there is no activity, you don't break your head, MPG and 10 causes, no. If there is activity, treat it because you already made a diagnosis of myeloma by the first three steps. So have you all found that? Yes. So I've got it on my Twitter. I don't know how to send it to this group. Should I send it to... I can send it to that uh, DNB group. 